This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 2nd, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the huge amount of additional spending that is being layered on the FY23 and FY22 supplemental budgets as the legislature nears the end of the session. Second, we discuss an ADN op-ed that essentially calls for middle and lower income Alaska families disproportionately to fund the $600 million requested by the Port of Alaska. And third, we discuss the one bill we believe needs to make it through the legislature before the end of the session and signed by the governor. And now, let's join Michael. First things first, we're going to talk about the out-of-control state budget and how it's gotten even larger. Uh, I mean, like, big-time larger. Brad Keithley joins us this morning live via Zoom. Let's talk about this. Uh, I know you sent me some stuff. We were talking back and forth a little bit on Sunday, uh, some of the numbers that were coming out, and it was a shocking the, I mean, and I'm not kidding. I mean, I'm not, this is not hyper, this is not hyperbole. This is like shocking the amount of money that we're talking about being in this budget without, still without a full PFD and uh, they have no problem spending it. Let's dive into that. Well, the budget process isn't over either. That's the, that's sort of the, uh, the scary part of all this. Uh, over the course of the last week, uh, some more budget numbers came in and I've uh, had a chance to total them up. Uh, over the weekend, and as of as of the last uh, update to legislative finances, uh, sort of running uh, recount of of what the various committees are doing, uh, UGF spending for FY22 uh, is up something like six hundred million dollars from the the governor's proposal. The governor's original proposal for FY22 was four point six billion dollars. Uh, now we're at something like $5.3 billion. I guess that's $700 million. Um, uh, and that doesn't count, $5.3 billion. And that doesn't count uh, the $1.2 billion uh, for that's being set aside for FY24 uh, K through 12, the so called forward funding of uh, FY24 K through 12. So that's $600 million up for, uh, for FY22 three uh, over the governor's proposal, but that's not the shocking one. To me, what really is the shocking one is what's going on with FY22, with the, with the supplemental for FY22. Right. When, you, when, when you get in a session, um, you're doing two budgets at the same time. One is you're doing the forward-looking budget for the next fiscal year, but you've also got the ability to add supplementals uh, to the prior years, to the current year's budget. Right, what you're going through right now, right? The year that you're going through right now. Right, which was passed in the last legislative session. Usually, and and this is what, you know, Ledge Finance does and other budget analysts do, usually you think about the supplemental being in in, in the $50 million range. Um, and, And you think about it for being things like, you know, uh, we've had we've had to fund disaster relief, sort of add supplementals to disaster relief over the last few years as we've had fires right. and we've had to go out and hire and, and have more people, more uh, activity 
around uh, around fire suppression or there's you know some bills came due that you didn't expect you lost some lawsuits usually that's around 50 million dollars this year the FY22 supplemental uh, as best i can calculate it at this point is somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 million dollars 500 million dollars in supplementals for the operating budget um, and 300 million dollars in supplementals for the uh, for the uh, uh, capital budget. And, and it's things like uh, school bond reimbursement. Uh, you, you will recall that the last few years we have uh, uh, reduced uh, the amount of school bond reimbursement uh, uh, by uh, a given amount uh, each year. The, the state hasn't, quote, fully funded school bond reimbursement. Well, there's $280 million, almost $300 million in the FY22 budget, uh, the FY22 supplemental that looks like it's catch up for the past under, quote, underfunding of, uh, of school bond reimbursement. Uh, there is uh, $210 million between the FY22 and the FY23 supplemental, $210 million uh, for oil and gas tax credits. Some of that is due under the statute because of higher prices. But what the Senate has done is, is what Sarah Rasmussen in the House tried to do in House Finance, but got rejected on the House floor. What Senate Finance is doing is adding an additional amount, forward funding uh, oil and gas uh, tax credits. The REAA uh, Trust Fund, the, the, the fund that's used to support uh, our EAA schools is, uh, has 84 million in the FY22 budget. Uh, extra retirement contributions, uh, that is uh, additional contributions to PERS and TERS uh, to sort of build up the fund is 89 million in the FY23 budget. Uh, $150 million in additional money for legislative services in the FY22 budget. It's, it's just sort of, I mean, just the list just goes on and on and on. And so you've got 800 million. Now, again, the typical supplemental is somewhere in the $50 million range. You've got $800 million in the FY22 supplemental. The, the, sort, of, the sort of amazing part of that is you got $800 million for additional spending, none for a supplemental PFD, none to try to bring the PFD even up to POMV 5050, much less uh, up to the up to the full uh, up to the full statutory level, so the, the the spending is is sort of just rolling on. They're spending on top of spending on top of spending, and it's not being covered very well uh, in the in the mainstream media. You don't see you don't see an article analyzing it in the ADN. You don't see it in the Fairbanks News Miner, the Juno Empire. You don't even see it on Must Read. Frankly, it's just it's just piling up. There's one other way. That, that is just sort of shocking. In the, the FY22 uh, uh, budget now has, the FY22 supplemental has $32 million, $320 million in additional uh, capital budget, the uh, supplemental capital budget. The FY23 uh, budget now has $380 million in capital budget. Last week, uh, uh, the Transportation Committee, the Senate, uh, the Senate Transportation Committee voted out a GO bond, a general obligation bond bill that has another $380 million on top of that. So we're, we're talking about in one year between what, they what they're shoving into FY22, what's now in FY23 as they increase the capital budget in FY23, and a GO bond that adds additional bond, general obligation bond that adds additional money. We're talking about a billion dollars in, a, in capital spending being authorized um, in one year. That's on top of whatever, you know, the federal government uh, is, is bringing to us uh, uh, in, in, in terms of capital spending on, in addition to that. So, you know, if, if all of this goes through, if the, if the FY22 supplemental stays as it currently is, or, you know, maybe grows, the FY23 stays as it currently is, if the GO bond is passed out of the legislature and ultimately passed by uh, uh, the, the population uh, by voters, we've got a heck of a lot of, of capital money that's, uh, that's, that's about to hit the state. So it's spending, it, it, it had been quiet on the spending front, frankly, right. uh, uh, up, to, uh, up to about the last week, but now it's just, uh, now it's just exploding. 
And as I said, uh, we're not, we still don't have either an operating budget or a capital budget out of, out of the Senate, uh, right. not even out of Senate finance. They're not even on the floor. So we may not be finished with this yet. Um, all of this additional spending, a billion for an additional spending between FY22 uh, and FY23, plus 300 million, three, nearly $400 million in the GO bond, and no additional PFD uh, in either FY22 or uh, FY23. And this doesn't even address, even after all that spending, the additional monies that are going to be surplus over this year and maybe next year uh, based on the uh, based on the revenue. I mean, so we're spending what we have like drunken sailors. We're going to have a bunch of money left over on top of that and still no statutory PFD, no back PFD, nothing like that. Everything else gets taken care of, but forget about the money that it belongs to the people. Yeah, the, the, one, the one thing that really you know, really irritates in that regard is going back uh, and truing up uh, the school bond reimbursement. I mean, that's what they're clearly doing. When you look at, when you look at those dollars, what they're clearly doing is they're going back and, and, and they're going to distribute money back to the school district or back to the yeah, school districts uh, or the municipalities for, uh, for past uh, school bond uh, reimbursement. They're, they're paying that back. Not even, but not even, not even a mention and of uh, trying to even get, you know, the FY22 or the FY23 PFD uh, to match up, uh, match up to statute. Right. Um, this is, <clears throat> well, it's the definition of insanity at this point. The amount of money that we're talking about being pushed out there for all these things um, and no discussion on this. And, and as you said, I mean, it's an election year, Brad. What's the first thing they want to do? They want to make sure that they forward fund all those school bonds so that people can't say that they didn't support the, this and the, that. They forward funded $1.2 billion for schools uh, and everything else. I mean, it's literally, it seems like the smorgasbord of uh, of options for those that are looking to get reelected at this point. Yeah, and it's all coming at the expense. I mean, it's being funded in large part through PFD cuts from, from, from the statutory level. It's coming at the expense of middle and lower income Alaska families. And it's just... You know, it's just irritating. It's irritating to see this additional spending after what we've just been through the last decade. I mean, come on, did we not learn any lessons from the last decade? Right. It's irritating to see all this additional spending. But then on top of that, it's irritating irritating to see that, you know, it's coming at the expense of middle and lower income Alaska families through continued PFD cuts. Shameless bribery. That's what uh, that's what uh, Brian says. And uh, I would not disagree with that. I mean, to me, this is very much geared towards these people being able to go out there and tell their constituencies, oh, look what I did for you. I protected you from having to pay back these school bonds, which you were always on the hook for, and the state was never guaranteed to pay. And now we can do it on top of that. Um, And, of course, all these capital projects, too, that we're going to bring to your communities. And, I mean, a billion dollars spent. Uh, on this kind of stuff, plus another three hundred plus million dollars for the reimbursement of the school bond issues, and yet not a single extra dollar going towards past or future PFDs in that regard. It is well, I mean, it again. I think you said frustrating, irritating. I don't know what what we want to use, but it is definitely all of those things, Brad. Well, it's it's a it, it's an indication that the legislature is there. It, it, there's a there's a divide between government and the people of Alaska, and the legislature is there to look out for government and to look out for government services and the constituencies that are tied uh, to government services, um, and they and and they really don't care uh, about middle and lower income Alaska families who are the ones that are ending up paying for this uh, through uh, through PFD cuts. It's uh, uh, it, it is sort of staggering in 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 the scope as you sort of go through these projects and see what they're spending it on. I mean, oil and gas forward funding, oil and gas tax credits. I mean, I, I'm one of the I'm one of the historically been one of the staunchest defenders of of uh, the oil industry and the need to play fair with the oil industry. But forward funding, oil and gas tax credits. That's just I I, I just <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. That's just 
That's just carrying over the edge. They got uh, all the money. And, 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 and all of these, all of the supplement, when you go through the supplemental, the 800 million in the supplementals, when you go through the 600 million in the, in the additional uh, spending that uh, is being added over the governor's budget in FY23, it's just, you know, it's project after project, spending after spending after spending. And it's not, it's not, I mean, some people say, oh, it's just more entitlement programs. No, there's not, there's not, uh, there's not a Medicaid expansion in the bunch. Right. <laughs> it's, it is, it is projects that are for uh, specific groups of Alaskans, specific constituencies that they've been down there lobbying for. Uh, and they've been able to convince the legislature uh, of their case. So this is actually kind of a win for corporate cronyism, right? I mean, businesses that have built their business model around government contracts, uh, whether that's telecom, whether that's construction, whether that's whatever, they've been down there lobbying hard to get these monies to get out there because they're dependent on it. And somebody said, okay, we'll give it to you at this point. Am I, am I off base? You, no, you're on base. And then I would add on top of that the municipalities, local governments who are down there lobbying for things like, uh, like school bond reimbursement. Right. I mean, it's, it, it, they, they are another segment of, of, of industry of the lobbying industry down there trying to, you know, look out for themselves. And everybody will say, all of them will say, Oh, well, this is in the state's best interest. It's in the base, best interest of us to come current on oil and gas tax funding or oil and gas tax credits. It's in the best interest of the state to, for us to pay back all these uh, all the uh, school bond reimbursements in the best interest of the state to do this or do that. It's in the best interest of a segment of the state. Uh, it's in the best interest of a group uh, of uh, a part of the state. But, you know, you add all this stuff up and, and we've just spent a heck of a lot of money satisfying a lot of constituencies and leaving, as, I, as, as you and I have both said, leaving middle and lower income Alaska families out in the cold. Right. Well, and again, this goes back to a lot of companies, which we have named previously on this program, including GCI and others in the telecom industry and the uh, AGCA and some of these other big uh, associated, you know, general contractors and, and other businesses who have built an entire business model up around a dependency on government spending. And they are more than willing to exercise and expend lots of dollars to convince legislators and the public that those monies are necessary for the state to move forward, not to mention to keep their companies afloat. <laughs> well, exactly right, Michael. And, and this is, this is the time that, you know, we're, we're flush with money, oil prices are up. So we've got all this oil revenue and this is the time that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to, you know, not only, not only get themselves well from the past, but to make themselves well going forward in terms of, forward funding of K through 12 and reimbursement of school bonds and forward funding oil and gas tax credits. It's, it's the time that they're trying to, you know, that they're trying to, you know, carve off as much for themselves as, as they can. Right. And, you know, and, and so their argument is if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. So I might as well do it. Right. Right. Uh, as part of this. Well, and special interests win again, which seems to be the common thread around here at this point. Uh, they always seem to be the winners, and the people, especially lower and middle income Alaskans, are the losers in in the deal. And it's all going towards, as Don Ardwin says in the chat room, a long term plan to eliminate the PFD. I can see that already. Handwriting on the wall. What are you watching this week? Uh, the budget uh, and SB one ninety nine, the PFD bill, the Senate's PFD bill that didn't go on the floor last week, uh, and uh, is still uh, sitting out there to go on the floor in these last two weeks. Uh, State Senator Rob Meyer says in uh, on YouTube, he says SB 199 hits the Senate floor today. So you'll be watching and looking for that today, and we'll be uh, we'll be seeing where it goes. 199, of course, is the 7525 bill. Starts out at 5050, but then you got to come up with 800 million in revenue. I'm going to be interested to watch to see what the amendments to that bill are going to be because that's where the rubber is going to meet the road. What can they get amended on the floor? Because this is an unusual bill coming out of a committee without enough votes to get it passed. Usually they don't pass it out unless they've counted heads. Uh, and this is this is going to be the fight of the year, I think, right here on this bill. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be an interesting bill. And, uh, and of course, it still has to go over to the House side if, if anything passes today. I mean, if I, had to, if I had to bet, I'm not sure that anything would pass uh, on this bill. It may get a lot of amendments and, and it ultimately may... Uh, 
may just end up not getting enough votes to pass. But yep, it'll be it'll be something important to watch. Well, that wouldn't be a bad thing. I mean, if it doesn't get enough votes to pass, that's not a bad thing. If it gets amended properly so that they take down the ridiculous eight hundred million dollar amount, if they change the length of the fifty fifty split, if they do I mean there's but again at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, whether it passes or not, this is still just a statutory change. They could still just, <laughs> at their convenience, ignore it and go, well, you know, it's just a, we got a conflicting, well, we got to do what we got to do, you know. Uh, I mean, that's the long and the short of it, right? Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Well, um, we're watching that. We're also watching SB 39, which is coming up for testimony today as well in Senate Finance. Uh, a lot of moving parts here as we come down to the last two weeks. Everybody's saying that uh, Bert Stedman and company want to be out of there before the end of the actual session. Uh, no idea yet what the governor's going to veto. Um, I mean, we just have, I mean, $600 million over his over his proposed budget, plus all this other forward funding stuff. I don't think he has any impetus to really wield the veto pen unless, I mean, I don't know. I, I can't read his mind at this point. What do, what do you say here plus, in the last minute? Plus 800, plus 800 million in FY22 supplemental. Yeah, I mean, exactly. it's just a, just a, 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 a tsunami of of spending that's uh, that's getting stacked up here. I I would not be a want, I would not want to be running for governor as a conservative if I don't veto a heck of a lot of this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's going to he's going to upset certain constituencies who otherwise, you know, thought they'd lobbied through a, a lot they'd played the game and lobbied through their money. But gosh, as a conservative, if you're running out there uh with uh you know, with having signed bills for 800 million dollars on FY22 supplemental and 600 million dollars above your above your proposal on FY23. I don't think I don't think you're going to be running as much of a conservative. The real beneficiary that's probably going to be Charlie Pierce who uh who can say, "Boy, I'd never do that." And, right, and right. you know, and 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 sort of become the mainstream conservative candidate while the governor's stuck out there having become the cor- uh, crony capitalist. Candidate. Yeah, no, he's yeah. going to have to really step up the plate. I mean, if he doesn't if he doesn't veto a substantial number of these increases, um, I think his, uh, you know, he, he, he's not going to be as, uh, as, uh, relative or as, uh, um, uh, he, he's not going to, he's not going to make it. Well, speaking of lower income and middle Alaskan families being affected, that actually leads us over to number two. Give us a quick tease for number two, the port of Anchorage. I mean, Alaska, I mean, Anchorage, I mean, whatever we're calling it these days, whatever it takes to get funding for it. Um, so the ADN had an op-ed by the editorial board uh, over the weekend about the port, arguing uh, that uh, that there should be additional funding for the port, and uh, and uh, essentially uh, saying why all of the excuses about additional funding should should be ignored, and we should uh, fund you know we should fund the additional port. What I want to focus on uh, is where that money's coming from, what the ADN argued, how the ADN argued. Uh, that the uh, that the that the port funding ought to be that the port ought to be funded, and I think that's uh, I, uh, another uh, uh, very uh, concerning thing. Uh, the ADN is uh, proving again that they really don't care about middle and lower income Alaska families. We continue now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, big editorial in the ADN. The title of that editorial is Lawmakers are happy to fight for a big PFD, but what's that attitude when it comes to the Port of Alaska? Uh, And yet it seems like the outcome still is the same, that uh, the lower income, lower and middle income Alaskans are going to be biting a harder bullet when it comes to this. Brad, give us your take on uh, what's going on with the Port of Alaska, Port of Anchorage, and, uh, and the fight over the PFD. So this entire editorial, and it's uh, dated April 30th, so it came out uh, over the weekend. This entire editorial is focused on uh, setting up the PFD against the Port of Alaska and making the argument that the Port of Alaska is more important uh, than the PFD. And so anybody who's fighting for the PF, it, when you when you think about the PFD, you ought to be putting the port first. And you ought to be, you know, prioritize spending for the port uh, over the PFD. There are good arguments for for spending for the port. I mean, a huge amount of Alaska's goods, imported goods, come through the port. Uh, they're distributed throughout the state. There are arguments for why we should uh, 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 maintain the port. Uh, and the municipality has a good argument for why that in part part of that 
uh, should be should be the state's responsibility. I'm not I'm not I don't want I don't want to use this segment to argue about about port funding. It's where the funding comes from that I think is that I think is the is the is the core of the problem. This editorial doesn't mention at all using equitable methods to, to pay for the port, using methods that all Alaska families uh, would contribute to, using methods that either uh, uh, have some sort of broad-based uh, tax to them uh, or some other form of funding that would involve all Alaska families contributing to the, toward the cost. The entire editorial is focused on uh, cutting the PFD, arguing that we shouldn't be paying a P big PFD, which is now defined as POMB 5050, uh, which is a, a third less than, uh, than, the, uh, than the statutory PFD. Um, we shouldn't be paying this big PFD uh, uh, when, we, when we ought to be funding the port. And the consequence, I mean, what they're trying to do is if you, if you fund the port through PFD cuts, which is what they're arguing, that pushes the burden. The people who are going to be paying for the port are middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20% will be paying a trivial share of their income and, and in fact, a trivial share of the overall costs uh, in, 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 in meeting that $600 uh, uh, funding, to the, funding to the port uh, uh, as part of if you, if you do it through PFD cuts. So once again, once again, the ADN editorial board is out there arguing that middle and lower income Alaska families, 80% of Alaska families ought to be paying for the, ought to be paying the bulk of the costs while the top 20% uh, uh, get by with uh, just, a, just a trivial share of the costs. And, I, and I, think that's, I think that's just outrageous. The fact that the editorial didn't mention at all that they're that they're that, that even consider that there should be other more equitable funding mechanisms, I think is just a I think it's just a, a horrible uh, uh, sign on their part that uh, that they're just you know they just want to take it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families and and let the top twenty percent escape let let the uh, let the let the the owners of the ADN and others in the top twenty percent escape. Uh, somebody in the chat room just said, I thought the funding for the port was coming from the infrastructure money, but this is none of that is appearing at this point. This is all talking about strictly state funding at this point. They have to compete for infrastructure money. Um, and, and the editorial does a good job, frankly, of, of dealing with that issue and saying that it was going to come from, uh, you know, that it, that, it, that it was going to come from infrastructure money. Part of it may come from infrastructure money, uh, but, the, but the port has to compete for it. And what they want the state to do is to is to come up with the funding uh, uh, in the in advance uh, in the in the event that they don't get the additional federal funding, and the and the article and the and the and the editorial makes a good it makes a valid point that even if they do get federal funding, it may not be to the extent necessary to uh, to uh, complete the port, um, and so they're going to need additional funding in any event. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. We're talking about the weekly top three. Uh, Brad, this whole thing uh, is is frustrating on many uh, many uh, levels for me personally because, again, I live in the Matsu. We've seen that the port of Matsu is a deep water port there at Point McKenzie. It could help lighten. It could help split that burden, lighten the burden. If we had a railhead there, it would help develop and dr drill that stuff to the other state. But it seems like we keep putting all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak, and and that's leading to I think some I, I think some real challenges uh, at this point. Um, what say you? Well, Michael, I I don't argue with that. Uh, I, yes, we could we could do Matsu. But again, it's all about funding. How are we going to pay for Matsu? How are we going to pay for the rail extension? How are we going to pay for whatever upgrades would need to be done? Um, <coughs> excuse me, at, at, at Matsu. It, 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 the the, the, the knee, knee jerk reflexive action that the ADN editorial takes and others take is well, we'll just take it out of the PFD. I mean, P, PFDs, you know, that's just slush, slush fund money. It's just, you know, going out there. Uh, to you know, to Alaska families, we'll just take it out of the PFD. It's a tax. When you take it out of the PFD, it's a tax, primarily on middle and lower income Alaska families. It's a regressive tax 
that takes the most as a share of income, increasingly from middle income and then lower income um, Alaska families. So yes, we can argue about whether Matsu ought to bear some of the burden. We can argue whether you know Anchorages should have. We we should just bolster up Anchorage, which is which has been the traditional point. We can argue about whether the rail extension. But the question, the ultimate question is whatever we do in terms of that spending, who's going to pay for it? And the fact that they're using the PFD, the fact that the, that the go-to slush fund now is the PFD <clears throat> means that middle and lower income Alaska families are paying for it, regardless, statewide. I mean, right. you got, you got, you got people in Nome with, with PFD cuts. You got people in Bethel. You got people in, uh, in, uh, in, in Barrow. You got people in Toke. Uh, that are going to be contributing to these middle and lower income Alaska families in those communities uh, that are going to be contributing through uh, through PFD cuts. So I, yes, we can argue about whether it ought to be the Matt Seaport, the rail extension, uh, Anchorage. We can argue about all that. But, but the, the question big, yeah. to me is who's going to pay for it? The biggest argument is where is the money coming from? And it seems like it always goes back to the piggy bank being the PFD, which again goes back to the comment earlier from Don Ardwin who said this is all part and parcel of the plan to basically eliminate the PFD and let them use it to spend however they want. Yep. Uh, the, the top 20% are on a roll. They're going to, they're going to do as much as they can to, uh, right. Uh, to, to fund the state through, uh, through PFD cuts. All right. Well, let's move on to number three. Uh, we actually made it to number three today, which is a discussion on what you consider to be one of the biggest uh, issues that we should be facing before the end of the session. Although it doesn't seem to be getting a lot of love and that is campaign finance reform. Campaign finance reform has gotten out of the House. It's over in the Senate. Uh, it's, I think it's still in Senate state affairs. I think they have a hearing uh, on it this week. So it's, it's one of those that has a chance to make it before the end of the session. To me, if somebody said, you know, what's your, what's your top three priorities, campaign finance reform would be one of those top three priorities. I think we're facing... And elect without campaign finance limits, I think uh, we're facing an election uh, cycle this year where we're going to have just huge amounts of money. And if the Republicans think it's all going to go to their side, they're just absolutely mistaken. If the Democrats think it's all going to go to their side, they're absolutely mistaken. It's just going to be a huge amount of money come into the state. If Roe versus Wade is overturned, if the if the if the news uh, over the last day is is a correct representation of what's going to happen when the Supreme Court rules on it. We're going to have a wild election season. Uh, the whole CONCON debate is going to turn into pro-life and pro-choice uh, because, you know, we've got the right to privacy provision in the current Alaska Constitution and the, and the pro-life people are going to push a constitutional convention to, to wipe that out, not trusting that they're going to be able to get a, a, an amendment out of the uh, out of the uh, out of the legislature. So it's it's a it, we are facing a wild election season in which Alaskans don't control the outcome because it's going to be a huge amount of money coming in from outside. I think I think a, a very important thing that this legislature needs to do before it goes home is enact co campaign finance reform. I think a very important thing for this governor to do before he goes home uh, is enact campaign well, finance reform. And I think everybody's going to rue the day if they don't do it. Well, and and explain why. I mean, the, the specific problem with the campaign finance reform at, at, re, uh, reform at this point is the fact that we now currently have unlimited amounts, unlimited contribution limits. I mean, there is basically you can give anything to anyone, any race, any candidate. I mean, that's that's the problem right now. We could become the dumping ground for, uh, uh, the, you know, the so-called dark money from outside and everything else. We got about a minute here. Well, absolutely right. I mean, with, with unlimited restrictions, the, the pro-life movement, again, if Roe versus Wade is overturned, the pro-life movement is going to come in in support of Les Guerra. A lot of money coming in in support of Les Guerra. Governor Dunleavy, you know, the Republicans think that, that campaign unlimited financing works to their benefit. It doesn't. We saw that on, on Prop 1 uh, in, the, in, the last, uh, in the last election cycle, the, the ranked choice voting. We're going to see a lot of outside progressive money come into this state uh, if Roe versus Wade is, is overturned. We need to have limits so that Alaskans are able to decide uh, Alaska elections as opposed to a, a ton of outside money uh, coming in to decide them. 
Oh, I can't imagine. We watched what happened with ballot measure number two. We watched this. Well, I mean, let's face it. We, we've we been seeing this. This is a pattern. Uh, ballot measure number two. They spent about seven million dollars to get people to pay attention to that and to uh, and to and to vote in favor of that. A lot of people didn't even know after they'd voted what they'd actually voted for. Uh, we saw it during the debate on um, on uh, um, Prop One. We saw you know millions of dollars being poured into that. We saw it in previous bills uh, that tell that when GCI spent four or five million dollars to get the POMV changed and all these other things. We've seen the influence, the outsized influence that millions of dollars can have on Alaskans, and not having any contribution limit on that or on candidate contributions could. And, and on top of that, add the ballot measure two stuff and the rank choice. And I, I mean, this could just be, un, it could be unbelievable. This could be the like the, the of a lifetime. Could be something of a lifetime at this point. The real beneficiaries of it are going to be the TV stations and the newspapers and the and the and the people who print the flyers that 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 come in your mail. That's that's going to be where a lot of this money goes. Uh, but Alaskans are going to be inundated with it. And and what's really what I what I can't emphasize enough for those that think they're going to have the advantage by unlimited financing by you know if the Republicans think they're going to have the advantage by unlimited financing they aren't if the if the Democrats think they're going to have a, a advantage by unlimited financing they aren't the losers are going to be Alaskans who have all of this money coming at them all of these messages. Uh, coming at them and sort of lose control of their own election. We be, we become we become sort of the 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 battleground for again if Roe versus Wade is overturned we we become sort of the battleground for you know national national elections and people who you know Alaska is a cheap date. You and I have talked about this a lot. It's cheap to advertise here relative to elsewhere in the country. Um, People will, will, will come in and, and use that money to try to influence the Senate election. They'll come in and try to influence the governor's election. They'll come in to try to influence the constitutional uh, convention uh, uh, voting. Uh, we're just going to have a huge amount of money. We need to get it under control. The irony of this is the federal election, the Senate race itself, will be subject to those limits, will be subject to federal uh, limits on uh, campaign contributions. Right. But the state races won't, and 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 we're going to see an unlimited, a, a huge amount of money come into the state races. Frankly, trying to indirectly influence the Senate race, it's just going to be a nightmare. And 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 the one way to get it under control is to put campaign finance limits back in place. There's a bill in front of state Senate Affairs to do it. I hope they I hope they get it out, and I hope they reconcile any issues uh, with the House uh, before before the end of the session, or else we're just going to. We're going to be talking about this for years to come, how, you know, money flooded Alaska in 2022. All right, uh, Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. We appreciate it. We got to go. Uh, thanks for coming on the program this morning. Mike, Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.